This is Awareness Explorers. Welcome back, Awareness Explorers. It's great to have you. We have a special guest today who wrote one of my favorite spiritual books, John Prendergast. But before I interview him with Brian, I want to say hello to Brian. How are you doing, Brian? I'm excellent, Jonathan. Uh, I'm uh, very happy to uh, to talk with John because I also um, loved his book, uh, The Deep Heart. And uh, I'm, I'm really looking forward to this. Well, me too. So let me say a little bit, for those of you who don't know John, uh, John Prendergast, PhD, is a retired psychotherapist and an adjunct retired professor at California Institute of Integral Studies. He's a co-founder and advisor to the Conference on Non-Duality and Psychology and the author of In Touch and his latest book, The Deep Heart, Our Portal to Presence. I was telling John before that uh, In Touch is one of my favorite spiritual books. I look forward to reading The Deep Heart. And I've been thrilled to be able to talk to you and ask you some more questions. So welcome to Awareness Explorers. Oh, thank you so much. Great to be here. So where to begin? Um, you know, In Touch is largely about uh, a somatic approach to spirituality. Uh -huh. And that's been so big the last 10 years or so. Now I'm wondering... For those people who are not using that approach, what would you say are the potential benefits or why it's so um, becoming so popular in spiritual circles? Well, um, I imagine it's becoming more popular because um, in the field of um, not only spirituality and psychology, it's um, people really want to have the feel for when things are real when they're authentic. Um, <clears throat> so much of psychology has been intellectual and conceptual. Uh, and the same is true of spirituality. So we have these great ideas and grand, you know, descriptions of processes, but really the transformational process is felt in the body and includes the body and not just the physical body, but the subtle body as well. And so that's the, probably an aspect of my work that sets it apart from most approaches is that it includes and highlights the subtle sensing of the body. And why is that important? Because the mind is so tricky and uh, so kind of easily, uh, easy to be deceived by, but we can feel a shift in our body. We can feel an opening. Um, and this really, I'm, and I mentioned this in my own process too, because, you know, I'm <clears throat> by tendency very skeptical and so even though in my own kind of experience of being on retreat and different teachers, I would have really <clears throat> some really substantial openings, my mind would question it saying, did you make that up? You know, is mm -hmm. that for real? But as I began to really sense my body shifting and particularly the, the subtle sense of the body opening, grounding, heart opening, sense of space, all these things I write about and in touch, um, <clears throat> those doubts fell away. And, and I feel like the, the subtle body is a very important bridge between um, our essential nature, which is spiritual as open, loving awareness, and our very material life, you know, our ordinary life of paying the bills and being in relationship and dealing with challenges and uh, of various kinds. So, so it's a very integrative, I find a very integrative approach, a very inclusive approach. And it's an approach that we can relate to in a palpable way. Good answer. Uh, I, before I take over, I want Brian to be able to step in <laughs> because I have a lot of questions. <laughs> well, sure. I have tons of questions, too. I guess maybe the first question is, is about your book, The Deep Heart, in which you use a wonderful overarching metaphor of the pilgrimage. Uh, you say uh, the inner pilgrimage is the abiding shift of attention from the forehead to the heart area. Yeah. And so I was wondering if you might expand upon that for our listeners about, about that shift and, and what is the deep heart and why shifting from, from the head to the heart is, is, is effective. Well, it's, it's the most important thing. And we are 
our ordinary seat of attention is in the forehead. It's kind of interesting for viewers and listeners like to kind of check, you know, where is your attention centered right now? And uh, very often it's up in the forehead and what my, one of my teachers, Jean Klein, called the factory of thoughts. So we're, we're engaged in our thoughts and we're identified with our thoughts and, and we're very engaged with the strategic mind. And the strategic mind's job is basically to um, solve problems and envision possibilities, all of which we need to navigate ordinary life. And so the analytic capacity and the strategic quality of the mind is important for survival <clears throat> physically and socially, but it's a very limited approach to life. And it is very partial in its view. It's very separative in its view. And so, you know, as, as wonderful as analytic and rational thought is, uh, it's based really on a sense and a view of separation. And we are seeing the consequences of living that way all around us, which is a profoundly unsustainable way of living and relating to one another and to the biosphere. And so we really need to shift our mode of perception and our way of being um, in order to actually live in harmony and live in harmony with a greater sense of wholeness and a greater sense of interconnectedness as well. And this is the domain of the heart. So the, the great pilgrimage, and we see, as I write in the book, there are many outer pilgrimages, secular and religious, that, that people participate in. But really, the essential pilgrimage is the shift of attention down into the heart area. And how does that happen? Well, we begin to understand uh, the limits of thought. It's a wonderful tool, but it's not a good, um, it's not a good ruler. You know, it's not a good master of our lives. And, and so as we begin to become more comfortable with not knowing and, and simply being quiet and open, a relaxation happens and attention begins to drop down into the heart area. And the heart area, and, and you know, it's, a, it's actually an energetic center, but not just that, because it's a portal to a much deeper way of knowing and feeling and being. The heart area has a tremendous sensitivity that opens us up both to love and to wisdom. And I, I use the phrase, I'm not original in this way, talking about heart wisdom. So this, this is where we need to go, I think, individually and collectively. Um, in order to really <clears throat> come from a much deeper, uh, much more intuitive, much more loving, much more holistic way of being. And the heart has many layers to it. It has a psychological or egoic layer. It has a soul level, which is unique to each of us. That's not egoic, still individualized. And then a kind of universal level or dimension. And the deeper we go in our exploration of the heart, the wider it gets and the more open we are actually to universal and archetypal energies to come through us. And it comes through as gratitude. It comes through as, as appreciation, it comes through as kindness. It comes through as an intuitive sensing of our non-separateness with the whole of life. And this is, this is what happens as the, wake, as the heart awakens and as the mind awakens. As the mind awakens, we have a sense of more and more clarity, uh, actually in sense of an infinite, an infinite sense of awareness and spaciousness. As the heart awakens, there's a sense of deep, unconditional love, profound empathy. Um, and as the hara, the lower center opens, we have a profound sense of stability, something that's unchanging and a sense of uh, well-being no matter what's going on. That was quite a, a lot there. I want to unpack <laughs> a little bit of it. Sure. Um, in your book, In Touch, one of the things I liked about it is you have a lot of very simple practices yeah. and very practical. And one of them uh, involves like imagining breathing into the heart area and specifically breathing into the back of the heart. Uh -huh. And I'm wondering if you can say more of, of what your experience is with that or what, what that is trying to get at. Well, this is, you know, this is based on my experience um, in terms of my own subjective exploration. 
but also my work with 40 years, you know, with people primarily individually, but also in small, small and now large groups. And this is the, the depths of the heart that I was alluding to before. Like very often we're out of touch with our heart because it was too painful or our education system has just devalued it. So we don't pay attention at all. But often there's a kind of hardness there because we've been hurt in some way. And often that hurt, that wounding happens when we're children it was too painful to experience a sense of unworthiness or being unlovable or to have that kind of deep sense of shame. So we cover it up. And so often in psychology, we're opening up to this actually fairly deep level of the heart where these very tender early aspects of the psyche uh, dwell. And um, very often psychology stops there, kind of with the inner child work, the parts work, the integrating that into adulthood. So we actually do feel more mature and integrated and in touch with ourselves. But there are deeper levels too. There's the level of, I was mentioning before, the soul. And non-dual teachers don't talk about this very much. And transpersonal psychologists and unions and, and uh, <clears throat> shamanic workers talk about it a lot. But it's a very subtle energetic level towards the back of the heart and it felt uh, as some kind of radiance and it has a specific kind of tone or color for each of us metaphorically speaking a unique expression and when we're not kind of running our ordinary egocentric programming and caught in our stories and old images um, actually when we know ourselves fundamentally as no one you know but as awareness itself this area really lights up and comes forward. It's like when we know, when we know we're no, no one, then we can actually be someone that's authentic. Mm -hmm. um, and then some, many approaches stop there. You know, they think this is it, the beautiful essential qualities of being uh, associated with this soulful level. But it's still a localization of attention and of awareness. And now we're getting to the very back of the heart that you're asking about. And I was just working with someone a few hours ago, a very deep spiritual practitioner, many years. And, and he was encountering um, an, an early fear of uh, engulfment, by, uh, being engulfed by the, the love and need of another to be loved. And there was an old story that if he didn't guard his heart, he would lose himself. And this began, you know, probably very, very early on. And just identifying that belief and, and questioning it allowed it to release. And he could feel, and I could feel, the back of his heart opening. It was fascinating. And this just sense of vast space behind the heart area. So in this sense, the heart is a portal. You know, it begins as a kind of energy center, a psychological uh, repository of conditioning, and then an energetic center here felt as warmth in the center of the chest. But it opens up. Um, into this vast sense of spacious and loving awareness. So that transition, you know, from an egocentric to a more soulful and then ultimately non-dual um, uh, openness uh, is the great potential of the, uh, the heart awakening. And when you talk about the great heart as opposed to the deep heart, you're talking about that universal sense of, yes. of, of oneness with everything, right? Exactly. Yeah, it's that sense of unity or non-separateness. And it is not in the mind at all. The mind is kind of in astonishment of this because the mind can actually not conceive of non-separation. I mean, we can intellectually conceive, but it cannot grasp our essential non-separate nature. And the mind is in awe when there is a revelation from the heart. And I, in my experience, when you connect with that vast, spacious, unified, you know, I just call it uh, universal awareness, um, yes. and, uh, that apart from the conceptual mind, just sensing back and just sort of resting yes. as that, yes. that joy floods up automatically and love it's floods up. But sometimes I have a hard experience hard time explaining exactly why that happens <laughs> <laughs> well yes the mind the mind is a little baffled the, 
Right. Right. But we're actually tapping into the source of mm -hmm. these essential qualities. And so, you know, there are uh, approaches, uh, Buddhist approaches of cultivating compassion, for instance, which are actually very good practices, cultivating kindness. These are essential qualities of being. And when we open directly into being through the heart, these essential qualities just come bubbling up, just a felt sense of joy, of fullness, of love, you know, of, you know this gratitude for no reason. This is, this is the beauty, isn't it? Yes, it's absolutely. Like we, we can be grateful for many things, you know, but this is gratitude without cause. The yes. gratitude of knowing the truth of one's being and the fullness of that. Right. And that's really key, isn't it? The fact that it's for no reason or without cause, because it's unrelated to the circumstances. It's not if this happens in our life, then we'll be happy. It's like happiness is actually our nature when we drop the conditions we have for experience. It, it is unconditional. Right. Unconditional yes. love, unconditional joy, unconditional gratitude, unconditional kindness. Mm -hmm. Well, I think we made a, a good pitch for the wonderfulness of it. And uh, <laughs> we've all experienced it probably in moments, most of our listeners. But what would you say to somebody trying to experience more of that in a busy life, how, how, how might they move in that direction? Well, um, you know, this is the kind of doing question, you know, how do we get there and in our busy lives? And it's a valid question. Um, I want to answer it a little bit differently, which is, um, it's not so much, it's, it's really about attuning to what's already here. And there is actually um, every moment a call from the depths of our heart, from, from the spark of radiance. And some of us are drawn to listen and some of us are not. And some of us have to be brought to our knees, you know, in terms of suffering, really to a place where we feel we can't do it. You know, we are not in control of our lives. It's too much. I give up. And something shifts. And then there's an attitude of openness and listening. So that's the path of suffering. Then there's the path of listening, you know, which has been more my path of, of sensing there's something more to life. There's something deeper, something truer. And that leads us to pay attention. How we do that will look many, many different ways. You know, um, but a, a simple way is actually by allowing attention to rest in the heart area and the way that you were mentioning these simple practices, like a, a beginning, a very beginning step, if we're interested, if we love a deeper truth. And this is, this is the point I'm making, that it, there's actually something in us that's drawing us within, right? And we're just responding to that. We're not doing by making something happen we're actually listening and following to something that's calling us in a very gentle, very loving, but very compelling way. So we give ourselves to listening. We bring attention to the heart area and, and maybe we sit for five or 10 minutes and we maybe to help um, ground our attention, we put our hand over the center of our chest. Maybe we use breath as uh, a little method to begin focus attention more and more deeply. All of this is a way to help, help the mind relax and let attention drop into the heart. And, and it's a kind of, in a way, it's a devotional practice. You know, it's like we are, but not devoted to someone um, and not even devoted to something, but actually being devoted to um, what we love and what's most true. So it's a listening and so we may dedicate time. We may set aside time in our busy life. We may get up, go to bed a little earlier and get up a little earlier and have 20 minutes of silence. Um, you know, another familiar mode is to just spend some time in nature, you know, and, and not in a goal, non-goal oriented way. You know, take a walk, let go of an agenda, and simply move into your senses, into just a listening mode. And then 
and then let yourself feel great, grateful, you know, that you are, that there is this wonderful experience of existing, this miracle of being. We can also start with a feeling of gratitude for someone we love, you know, or something that we love, and then let go of the object of our gratitude and follow the gratitude into its source. Another way, I'm giving all these little methods, you know, another is to follow the sense of I, the I am. And this is a method uh, from uh, Rana Maharshi and the Sagadatta Maharaj, the sense of I am. And because we're not who we think we are, we're none of our, these identifications and stories and narratives and meta narratives, we, you know, whatever we think, that's not who we are. So we can start with the very simple phrase, subvocally, I am. And, and, and go to the sense of it, the feel of it, and then follow, track that into its source. And that will take us deep into the heart, uh, into a space of just being consciousness, loving awareness. And when you say track it back to the source, do you mean where it begins or, yes. or what, is, what is the source of I am? Or? Yeah, it's the love that we've been speaking of, this open, mm -hmm. loving awareness. No. So it's our true identity as opposed to all the personality we think of in our, in our minds. Exactly. It gets very like, I'm not, it's, I am not this, I am not that I simply am. We begin with that, you know, whether we're dreaming or waking, right? There is a sense of this. I am, and actually it's there in deep sleep. Uh, most of us aren't aware of it. The I am the sense of consciousness. And so we actually, um, you know, one of my, one influential teacher who died before I met him was Nisargadatta Maharaj, sage from Bombay, India, passed away in uh, the fall of 81, uh, August 81, or September 81. But his teaching was, you know, give all of your attention to the sense of I am and just be with that, sense it, feel it, give your heart to it, and it will take you to your deepest self. So there are a lot of different approaches. Some are more with feeling, some are more with sensing, so, you know, starting with gratitude, uh, feeling the heart area. But I think the deepest thing is that we, we actually love something you know, in the core of our being and we give our attention to that. Your answers are, are so poetic and complete. I really appreciate them. Um, in, in your book, In Touch, you talk about uh, kind of four... I'll call it approaches or avenues of somatic uh, opening as uh, relaxed groundedness, inner alignment, open heartedness, and spaciousness. Uh -huh. I thought that was an interesting way to um, kind of create new distinctions that are potentially useful. And I'm wondering what you can say about those four distinctions and how they might relate to a, a person doing practice? Well, this came out of my, just my work, my direct work with people. And I could see, I could just feel and sense, I began to feel and sense what would happen when people would kind of drop in to what was true for them. Like once they got over the mental chatter, once they fell into a trusting relationship with me once they kind of settled in. And often that would happen very quickly once we started. As, there, as an inner search would, would unfold, a kind of shift of attention inwardly, and as there would be a discovery of what was authentic, these different facets of subtle somatic experience, one of them or two of them, occasionally all of them, uh, would start unfolding. And, and I began to understand that this was the sense of knowing, the subtle sense of knowing that the body has this remarkable capacity that is largely unacknowledged. We do see in felt sensing the work of Eugene Genlin, um, kind of the discovery of this principle, this whole body knowing of something that's initially vague, then prior to the splitting of um, the mind and you know, of thought and feeling, so he was one of the first to articulate this, at least in the West. But the tradition of subtle body awareness, of course, goes back in particularly in Eastern contemplative traditions. You'll see 
bits and pieces of it in Western ones, but it's developed in yogic and Taoistic and Buddhist uh, pra- among them practitioners. And so um, the body, the, as the body is less conditioned, as it's less under the influence of our stories, um, it becomes more and more available to actually sense the ground of who we are. And these aspects began to appear. It's like when, pe- when, we, when we feel more and more authentic, there's a sense of being deeply relaxed. We're at ease. We don't have to show up in a particular way. We don't have to prove or disprove anything. We can just be as we are. And there's a sense of attention like just dropping down, you know, almost like an elevator. It's like, you know, and we just, we, we land, we kind of land in our bodies. We land in the present moment and there's a sense of being in our bodies and being grounded. Like I'm talking about it now I'm sitting up more. It, it's like, it sits us up in a natural way. It's like we ground attention drops down. You know, we, we actually feel our pelvis, the lower legs, our feet, and we begin to feel this natural sense of alignment too. Now you're sitting up too. <laughs> exactly. Well, <laughs> right. you know, each of these are, are almost like um, distinct portals. So they are. As I was reading about them, I said, oh, groundedness. Yeah, check. Alignment. You know, I move my body a little bit, my spine a little bit. Check. Yeah. Open heartedness. Okay. Yeah. I'm now relaxing into that. And then spaciousness. It was, it was almost like an elevator as you said, uh-huh. down into beingness. It is, yeah, down and back. Mm-hmm. So there's, a, there's a dropping down. When we, when we feel deeply grounded, that supports the flowering of the system. Mm-hmm. But it's a very subtle interaction between all these different levels of the mind and feeling and our deep somatic and instinctual nature. So it's not you know, linear, um, kind of a progressive linear process, but much more intuitive and fluid. Mm-hmm. But they, they do interact. We, when we feel more grounded, we actually feel more safe, too. When we feel more safe, our hearts can open, mm-hmm. you know, not just a little bit to someone, you know, that one trustworthy or few trustworthy people, but we feel a general open-heartedness to humanity and to life. So this interaction between ground and heart is very uh, profound, in fact. And, and we, in the relaxation, there's a nat- and groundedness, there's a natural sense of this uprightness and verticality. And this verticality feels like we're like more and more present right now. There's a sense of just being in the timeless now outside of, you know, really outside of time and the sense of space. Similarly, a vast space begins to open and the body begins to acclimate to source, to its true nature. This is the awakening of the body. So the body, the, the opening of the body supports the process of awakening. Um, It validates that that process is happening. It participates in that process. And awakening, that is to say, our fundamental nature as awareness suffuses the body-mind, penetrates it more and more deeply, transforms it. And this is the embodiment process. So we're not just transcendent, you know, going off into some other realm, right? Although that, that, Knowing of ourself as formless awareness is a very important step, not bound by anything or anyone. Um, But we're also here in a very, you know, vibrant, uh, very alive, very authentic way. So the body is is participating in this, affected by this, um, supporting it, and transformed by it as well. And that reminds me of, of, there's a paradox in spirituality that I've always been fascinated with. And you, I think, allude to this to a certain degree in, in uh, the deep heart. And, and that is that the first step being the sort of dropping of the idea of the individual personality and seeing that there is really no separation, that who we really are is really universal. But some people report that 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 they feel a sense of dryness or, 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 and that's not my experience. My experience is that the, 
at the same time, the paradox is that the individual personality with all its talents and skills and foibles and stuff becomes more alive and engages with the world more. It's just there's less of a sense that that's the true me. That's right. But it doesn't it doesn't get sort of squashed and, and, and pushed aside or transcended in some way. Well, here's, I don't, you know, paradox is used a lot in spiritual language, and I think it's misused a lot because really often it's just things happening on different levels and, you know, they seem to be contradictory. It is true. Um, some people, so when we talk about spirituality and spiritual practice, it's a wide range of experience and uh, understanding. And, and sometimes, you know, people can sit in meditation for a long time and and uh, experience a lot of dryness. And what they're doing, you know, they're kind of trying to detach from and rise above their human experience. And in so doing, they're creating splits within themselves. And I did this early on in my practice as a TM practitioner and TM teacher. It was a brief, unillustrious career, <laughs> short one. But, you know, I go on these long meditation retreats and go into this profound quietness and silence. But I'd be exhausted at the end. It was very interesting. And the reason was, I think, I was cutting off from my humanity. And I wasn't, it wasn't, you know, accented in that particular approach, or at least for me, that was my experience. I get spacey and tired and kind of ungrounded. So um, that's the value of actually welcoming our humanity, our experience, our, our bodily sensations, our emotional activity, our crazy little minds, you know, that. Uh, get so easily seduced by beliefs. We we include all of that. You know, we welcome all of that. We from as much presence as we're in touch with. It's a welcoming approach, and and we know what it feels like to be welcomed. You know, it's like when we really feel welcomed, we relax. You know, and then things start moving, right? And maybe you know this wants to shift a little bit, and that wants to be let go of a little bit, and a very natural process of transformation is enhanced. And that's not dry at all. It's a very natural kind of unfolding because we're not being willful. We're not being um, trying to manage our spiritual life with our spiritual ego. Mm. That's a good phrase. Um, now that you're retired, I'm wondering what your life is now. Do you have plans? Do you teach? Do you, what, what, do you do practice wise during the day? What's, what's it like? Well, my retirement is largely in name only. <laughs> <laughs> so not entirely because I've actually cut back on my schedule. So um, I'm doing, I'm continuing with clients that I've worked with in the past, but meeting less frequent, frequently. Mm -hmm. So meeting once a month instead of every two weeks or once a week. Uh, so my workload is diminishing. I've been doing a lot of teaching um, during COVID, a lot of online stuff um, with sand and with uh, open circle and my own offering. I just, I'm coming near end of a nine month uh, online retreat uh, that I have with 125 people and, um, you know, more invitations ahead from different organizations. And I'll be offering an in-person retreat in San Rafael uh, in May next year. So that'll be nice after several years of not meeting in person. I mean, one of the interesting things, and you guys know this, it's like this is a, can be a very intimate exchange, right? We can feel each other. We can sense each other. We can, you know, this sense of awareness is contagious. So what's that about? You know, we're not limited by time and space. You know? Absolutely. So, so this is so interesting, you know. So, I, of course, I love sharing the understanding. Um, having these kind of conversations or, you know, having retreats and um, mm -hmm. of various lengths. Um, my daily practice, I, I do enjoy sitting, um, not to get anywhere, but it's like a, a just kind of quiet attunement. Usually in the morning, I'll sit for a while. Um, you know, I enjoy walking in nature. And, um, so, and I enjoy writing you know, and this is the reason why you guys are talking to me, right? And so I started a new book uh, as of last week on the ground. 
And this is kind of, kind of a trilogy. You know, the first book was in touch. Uh, second book, The Deep Heart. Now I want to talk about the ground. And it's, um, you know, it's an area that's not well understood and not well articulated because there's a lot of resistance um, and a lot of splitting that happens in spirituality uh, where we tend to, you know, we really valorize the heart area. We valorize mental and emotional illumination. We kind of stop there. Yeah. <laughs> well, what about the lower half of the body, you know? And this is the instinctual area, and it tends to be more dense. It's the area of, of power dynamics, of sexuality, of survival, um, and very deep kind of human condition tendencies. Uh, so, um, you know, my approach is essentially tantric, that is to say inclusive, not sexual, mm -hmm. but just inclusive and imminent. And so I think many people's spiritual paths tend to get bogged down uh, because um, they don't quite know how to work through th this conditioning, you know, conditioning of the mind, of the heart, and of the hara or the belly. So the, this book that I've just started, which will probably be a few years before it comes out, uh, is my latest little creative project. Mm -hmm. well, I, I don't know if I'm going to be able to wait two years, but I guess I'll have to. <laughs> but I'm looking forward to that. Uh, well, I'm glad. Any, uh, any final questions, Brian? Actually, I do have one um, because I, I came across a couple of quotes in The Deep Heart that I found really fascinating. And you said, spiritual realization does not necessarily translate into psychological maturity. Mm -hmm. And then you said, on the other hand, realizing that we are essentially whole is a huge relief from the self-improvement project. Uh -huh. And those two ideas really do go hand in hand. Uh -huh. um, but it's true. People think that, okay, I'm going to awaken to some spiritual realization and then all my psychological problems are going to end. Nope. But also I did find personally that letting go of the self-improvement project was huge psychologically. It is. Yeah. Yeah. They are. It's complimentary. It's, it's uh, there's a relief like, you know, for your listeners and viewers, you know, um, what, what if something in you already completely accepts you as you are? What if you are already deeply loved and accepted just as you are? Nothing to change, nothing to fix, nothing to get. Yeah. Can you just feel what happens? It's like a Oh, what a relief, <laughs> right? right? <laughs> and then like from that, so that's kind of what, that's really what awakening is all about, you know, is that is, is kind of that sense really comes into the foreground, you know, because that's actually the truth. You know, there is this universal loving intelligence that um, mm -hmm. holds this for us. We feel held. In that holding, there's a relaxation. In the relaxation, stuff comes up, right? But we're not, we don't orient it to it as a self-improvement project. If I fix this, then I'll be acceptable. It's more, oh, this wants to be met with love and understanding and curiosity, right? It's a very different approach to our human conditioning. When we approach our human conditioning with that quality of presence and affection and and attention, it just has a way of opening up and blossoming and melting. I mean, if it's frozen, it's going to melt, you know, and uh, if it's constricted, it's going to relax and, and it just naturally releases or integrates uh, into the system much more quickly. But we're out of the agenda of having to be perfect, you know, or imagining that conditioning is going to disappear completely because it won't. You know, we are deeply conditioned, everyone, and everyone I know, and I'm, I'm, I'm really, you know, kind of, you know, privileged to know a lot of wonderful, have friends, a lot of wonderful teachers, you know, they all have conditioning, you know, just like everyone, but their, our relationship to it changes. And that's really the critical point. You've covered so many things, John. I really appreciate it. Um, I know you have a guided meditation today. Is there anything that you want to cover or say that has not been spoken? Hmm. 
I think we're all here to wake up, you know, and uh, to wake up is to recognize who we really are. Um, and there's a, a deep impulse within each of us um, that's calling us home. Mm. And we all have a capacity to respond to that, to listen, to attune, to give ourselves to that. As we do, that spark of radiance of our being, our true nature, becomes, comes more and more into the foreground. In a way, there's a, almost like a dialogue that develops. Um, it begins to respond you know, to our openness, to attunement and alignment with it. Mm. And, and gradually and occasionally, suddenly, there's a shift from figure to ground. You know, from taking ourselves as a separate self to knowing ourselves as this universal loving awareness. Mm, and awesome. I think this is what we're here for, is mm. to allow that, to be open to that, uh, and then to live from that more and more deeply so that it's shared with uh, those we're intimate with and those we meet in the street. And it's, it's a na it naturally radiates out as it uh, comes into the foreground of awareness. And, and as that happens, as Brian was suggesting, our personality actually gets freed and our deep soulful qualities uh, begin to emerge. Our gifts, you know, our offerings um, are, come out that much more clearly and creatively and powerfully. Uh, so it's a deeply fulfilling um, invitation, possibility, uh, based on the reality of who we really are. So, you know, I hope your listeners, I mean, you've been interviewing many, you know, wonderful people and they're all kind of you guys and they and us are all pointing to this, yeah. you know, reality. And um, it's the real deal. Mm -hmm. I find I do have one last question from your book in touch. And uh, um, I know from your writing that your former wife died tragically oh. and, that you went through a, a long period of grief. And I know a bunch of people who are going through uh, similar types of grief now. Uh -huh. I'm wondering what you might say to them. You know, it's a, that's a process that we, we avoid death, we avoid grief. And I know you used it as best you could in your own process. I'm wondering if you could say, say something about that. Yeah, it's a very relevant question, you know, and particularly with COVID and so many people dying, you know, and so many people losing loved ones. Well, it's a very relevant question. Um, I mean, the first thing is, it's uh, important to allow grief. Um, in a way, grief is a sacred emotion. Uh, we grieve because we love. And so um, we honor our loved ones by grieving. It's a natural human feeling. Um, so it's important to allow grief to unfold. Uh, <clears throat> we can also, there are aspects of grief that are, um, we could say confused. Like we may think there, there may be stories that we attach that our beloved left us because we're, not good enough, you know, or we're being punished. And that's very important to let all of those stories go and just be with the, the depth of the feeling. The grief, when we open to grief, we open to joy. You know, the, the two are inextricably bound. And this is the poignancy of this human life is that we love and we lose um, our beloveds on a human level. And <clears throat> So that's on all kind of on a more, I would say, maybe obvious level. Most people understand this. Then there's a, a deeper and fascinating level. Uh, like in touch, I do talk about what happened after Linda died, my mm -hmm. late wife. And, um, you know, she was um, taken to the hospital. It was an ambulance I followed in my car. Um, half an hour later, they came out in the waiting room and they said, um, Dr. Prendergast, we're sorry to say, but your wife has died. And would you like to see her? And I came in 
And I looked at her body that was intubated and I knew that wasn't her. It was very interesting. It wasn't a, I didn't have to think about it. It's like, oh, she's gone. You know, it was very clear to me that I, some, some, some level I always knew that who she was when not, was not her body. And looking at her body, I, oh, she's gone. She's not here. So I walked down the hall to the chaplain's office and I just kind of stunned really. And, and she had many life-threatening illnesses. And so it wasn't a, not a complete surprise at all. In fact, she had predicted her death a uh, month before by a day. She, was, she had almost died the night before. But still, I was kind of in shock and sitting quietly. And then she came. I felt her in my inner space. And it was as clear as our conversation is right now. Jonathan. And she said, do not grieve for me. I am happy to be free of this body. And she had suffered a lot with multiple kinds of illnesses. And then I felt this whoosh, kind of shooting of energy up through my crown chakra and she was gone. So it's very clear that death is not what we think it is. And it's very equally clear that life is not what we think it is. <laughs> And it's equally clear that we're not who we think we are. So we're working with some really big mysteries here, the, this kind of interdependence of, of form and formless and life and death and what happens when bodies die and who are we really. And the more deeply we go into the core of our being, um, the more we feel ourselves as the ocean of existence. And so that allows the waves of our individuality and those around us, much more space to be as they are and to come and go as they are. So Beautiful. knowing that, knowing that, like being kind with ourselves and patient with ourselves on a human level is very important. And also the deeper we go in the knowing of who we are, the more openness there is to the comings and goings, the rising and falling of form, including the forms of our beloveds. Yeah. Thank you for that. Um, it's a subject that we haven't fully explored yet. I think we will uh, at some future episode, but that's a really good beginning. And um, my heart goes out to the people going through yes. difficult times now. Yeah. Yes. And I, I, I think that everything that you said is, is such a gift and uh, I'm really grateful to hear it and, and grateful that our listeners are, will be able to hear it oh, as well. Yeah. So I really enjoyed all the practices in your in touch book. They're like, like little written guided meditations. Uh -huh. And I uh, hear that you're going to guide us in uh, some kind of guide meditation now, which I'm eager to listen okay. to. Yeah, well, let's do that. We have about 10 minutes. Is that right? Yeah, about roughly. Okay. All right. So I invite everyone to sit comfortably uh, upright feet on the floor if possible or if they're crossed that's fine and close your eyes and take a few deep slow breaths let your attention drop down no efforting it's like there's nothing no problem to solve, nothing you need to take care of right now. So permission for the mind to relax and for attention to drop down and in to the core of your body. And take a minute to let yourself feel held. Your body is held by the gravity of the earth. You can relax into that. And when we really relax into the sense of being held, is we can notice kind of relaxation in the way that we hold ourselves up and in the way we grip 
ourselves inwardly. We allow that grip to relax. We may feel ourselves actually held by something greater than the gravity of the earth. And if you do, I invite you to relax into that deeper sense of being held. So allowing yourself to be just as you are in this moment. And then bring the attention to the center of your chest, the heart center. I invite you to breathe as if you could breathe directly in to this area and exhale from it. No forcing, no efforting. So each breath allows your attention very gently to rest a little more deeply into the heart area. Allowing the depths of the heart to begin to open. And depths of the psyche, your younger self when you're a little boy or a little girl. And embracing that child self with warmth, with care, with understanding. With love. You may want to spend more time here if needed. It's different for everyone. Continuing, if you like, and you're able to feel even more deeply into the heart to your unique way of being and the gifts that you have to offer. This is an archetypal level or soul level. Let it come to you. There's no work for the mind here. Like if you were completely free of concern about how you were seen by others, what would want to come out? What would want to be expressed more freely? If you're free of self-consciousness, so-called, what wants to radiate out and be shared? Let it come to you. No efforting. You may want to spend more time here. And allow your attention to drop even further back as if the back of your heart area opens into a fast, immeasurably vast space. Where you recognize your inherent wholeness and completeness just as you are.
the source of your being. The source of love, of joy, of gratitude, of kindness, compassion. And there's a recognition of your non-separateness from the whole of life, from everyone and everything else. Again, not a thought or an effort. So a listening and a surrenderance to our deepest knowing, our deepest feeling, our deepest being. And then just open your eyes a little bit and stay in touch with the depths of your heart. Be in a very receptive mode. Let the so-called world come to you, no grasping. All the forms that appear visually. Come to you, feel them in you. Not separate from you. Oh, beautiful. We can, some people may want to sit here with this and ask this for a while, but I know we are time bound in our program. <laughs> so thank you for, for uh, coming along. That was great. Um, yeah, very, very sweet. How can uh, people learn about you, John? Your website well, or yeah, whatever. website's best. It's called Listening from Silence, all one word. And um, I also have a YouTube channel. If you put in um, John Prendergast and then three words, Listening from Silence, you'll get the YouTube channel as well. And so I have a lot of talks and guided meditations and interviews. And um, I do have a mailing list if people are interested in um, occasional. Uh, emails about what I'm up to. Mm -hmm. um, I'd be happy to add them to the list. Great. And if people want to uh, support us and get extra stuff, we have a Patreon page at patreon.com forward slash awareness explorers. And uh, any last words, Brian? I'm just very grateful. I thought this talk was really beautiful and covered really essential topics in our in our in our life in both our sense of spirituality and just our happiness in living day-to-day -day life. So thank you very much, John. I really appreciate it and I can't wait for our listeners to hear it. <laughs> well, it's been lovely to be with you both. Yeah. Likewise. So friends, till next time, keep exploring. Keep exploring. Thank you for listening to Awareness Explorers. To learn more, you can check out our website at awarenessexplorers.com. Please subscribe to our podcast on your favorite podcast app. We'd love it if you would post a review. And please share our link on Facebook and with family and friends. Because knowing yourself as awareness is the greatest gift you can give yourself or someone you love.